Augustine Reina, Elena Gar says, Simonetta Vizzoso, thank you very much for your time and for agreeing to discuss uh, within Digital Markets Research Hub the issue of interoperability with messenger, ser messenger services, one of the hottest issues in the current regulatory agenda. And I propose we, you know, the idea of this meeting is to collect the views and opinions from, from stakeholders and thinkers who understand and maybe represent to some degree uh, the different views, not necessarily polar views, but diverse views, because there is no point in, you know, singing in, uni in unison. Um, so I hope you'll have an interesting and, and diverse uh, exchange of ideas. Uh, so without further ado, maybe we'll start with um, asking Augustine to set the scene and provide us just a general background, rather reminder maybe, about the, the, the importance of interoperability for messengers and maybe more broadly challenges, etc. Super. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boris, for the for the invitation. It's really a pleasure to be part of this uh, very topical uh, discussion uh, that concerns directly the implementation of the Digital uh, Markets Act. Um, indeed, interoperability has been a, a topic of discussion not only in the context of the of the DMA, but even more broadly, you know, in competition law, in sectoral regulation as well, being on financial services or telecoms. This is a, a topic that has been uh, always very present um, when it comes to opening up markets. And why is that? It's because the lack of interoperability, you know, raised barriers to entry. One can have a conversation and a discussion whether this is justified or not, but the reality is that it does. And it also can lead to consumer lock-in and, and therefore less consumer choice, less contestability, less competition in markets, so on and so forth. In the context of the Digital Markets Act, we identify provisions that concern horizontal interoperability, which is the case of um, instant messaging services, as we um, speak more, more generally, uh, but also uh, vertical interoperability, which concerns, for example, the uh, software and hardware that is provided by um, gatekeepers that have an operating system or a virtual assistant, and the possibility for other companies to plug in their services within this, uh, these uh, ecosystems. And all bearing in mind the need of making these markets more contestable and fair, both for uh, business users and um, and consumers you know, and, and, and users. I, of course, speak from the point of view of consumer organizations, of, uh, of consumers, and it's extremely important also to bear in mind what are the consumer expectations when it comes to interoperability and in concretely when it comes to interoperability in uh, communication messaging uh, services. And, and for example, one of our members, the German uh, consumer organization, they have conducted surveys, which actually shows that one of the main reasons for people for not switching to competing um, messaging services from the, the incumbents, for, for example, uh, WhatsApp, is because they will lose the network, the possibility to communicate with um, their, uh, their peers. And actually one third of them, 30%, would move away. So in, in our terms, you know, would switch to other, uh, other uh, um, uh, rivals if they could communicate with different networks. So here, of course, we see the very strong presence of network, network effects and how the combination of lack of interoperability and uh, strong network effects can cause um, barriers, barriers to entry and, and of course, reduce, uh, reduce switching. Um, so certainly there are a lot of questions to discuss when it comes to the concrete implementation of the Digital uh, Markets Act on all its obligations, certainly, but in particular on, on this one, which is one obligation also will require what we call further specifications or to be more precise, more uh, technical uh, implementation. And there we're going to discuss, of course, issues around security, privacy, uh, so on and so forth. So I, I leave it here and I'm, I'm more than happy to continue the discussion with my colleagues. Thank you very much, Augustine. And maybe we'll revert to Simonetta. Um, just uh, very recently, the commission hosted the second uh, stakeholder workshop 
related to different uh, provisions of obligation, different uh, obligations of, of gatekeepers, specification, listening, uh, different opinions. And you were uh, one of the engaged participants in, in, in the second workshop on, on, on interoperability. Maybe you can provide uh, to those of us who didn't have a chance to participate all, all day, uh, a summary of the main topics, maybe, and some you, 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 the, the main thesis which which you have articulated uh, in your session. So thank you so much, Alia. Thank you so much for the invitation and into the occasion to be here to discuss with Eliana, uh, yourself, and Agustin. Uh, yes, I had the pleasure of participating in this workshop, and my role was actually uh, the one of setting the scene. So from uh, so what was actually Article 7 about, what was the objective, the scope, the inbuilt trade-offs, uh, and then I had some uh, suggestions concerning effective implementation. So first of all, perhaps about this, uh, uh, the structure of, the, of our uh, technical uh, workshop, which I found really perfect in the sense that we had the first panel, which was the policy panel, Okay, so there was uh, myself, there was uh, a, a colleague of Agustin, uh, he mentioned already Verbraucher Centralia, the consumer, um, organization, consumer protection organization. And there was somebody from Barrick, so the regulating uh, agency for electronic communication, a uh, European one. And then there was somebody from uh, uh, civil society, so somebody from uh, uh, ADRI, so about uh, uh, human and consumer rights, uh, uh, so organization of other association, association of other organizations. So the so we had the policy uh, topic, uh, the, the policy panel, and then the other ones were actually engineers talking to engineers, basically. And this is definitely what we need to implement the DMA. So I really I did that the, the commission did a very good job in keeping us sort of separated. <laughs> so we were siloed in a sense because we didn't get the, the technical question that we were not able to, un to answer, like. Yes, what about the uh, end to end increase government? What are the issues there? You cannot ask it to me because I'm a lawyer and economist, so I, can, I don't answer it. So they did a really very good job in doing that. So I really applaud the commission for that. I must say, in the other technical workshops, it, it was not so nice and separated, but in ours, they did it. And then, the, the, so what about this uh, Article 7 that we are discussing? As Agustin already said, it has to do with horizontal interoperability. It was something. It was an obligation that it was not in the original proposal by the Commission. It should be really highlighted. And it was how come, how comes that we had it in the final text? Because there was quite a lot of pressure and from the side of the of the Parliament and from civil society. And by way of disclosure, I would like to say that I have written a study for a member of the European Parliament in which it was like me many others, uh, in which I proposed it, and I did also some uh, some work in the negotiations. So I was not a totally, I mean, that was, of course, expert work, but it was, I had a role in that as well. I think it's important to say in the sense that I'm not totally, perhaps, neutral <laughs> to the topic. Uh, so the so what about the Article 7 itself? Well, it requires the designate, that designated gatekeepers should ensure free of charge and upon request interoperability with certain basic functionalities of mix, that is number independent to personal communication services that they provide already to their own end users, and they should provide those functionalities to third party providers of such service. First of all, it's asymmetric, only designated case deeper, upon request, only basic functionalities, uh, and there are, I mean, we shouldn't forget, this is the longest obligation in the DMA by far, so I counted, if I'm not mistaken, 602 words. The second one, the second longest one is the Article 6.4, which has only 203 words by comparison. So it's really much detailed. It's, uh, it has been much polished during the negotiations. To my mind, there is not so much legal uncertainty. It's there, it should just be nicely implemented. Thank you very much, Simonetta. Uh, Eliana, if, you, if, if I can revert to, to you, uh, please. We uh, understand that the topic is very delicate because, uh, you know, th there are different normative uh, visions about the, 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 the requirement itself and the rationale behind it that, uh, you know, the, the companies who develop their uh, status on the market or their position on the market are not necessarily interested in, in opening up uh, the access 
to, to their services and thus to their users, etc. So there's, it's obvious that we don't have a consensual agreement here. And uh, you had a kind of an opportunity to, to, to work with one of the uh, gatekeepers who, who is probably affected most uh, by, by this provision. So maybe you can pro uh, provide us a summary of, of perhaps counter arguments or maybe different arguments or on the other hand, how, would, how should we understand the, 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 pro the, the cons of, of, of this initiative? Not okay. necessarily cons only, but from this perspective. Thank you, thank you, Ole. So first of all, so let me make a big disclosure here. So I'm expressing here personal opinions. I'm not speaking for any company organization. Uh, so so just just make that very very clear. Uh, but um, I, I think yes, I think that the 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 topic uh, should be a little bit more nuanced. Uh, when we talk about interoperability, I would um, it, it's not always that the companies uh, don't want inter interoperability. Uh, so I think we have to separate uh, the the context here. So we we already I was seen already refer. There's two types of interoperability. You have the vertical interoperability. You have the horizontal one. Uh, the DMA promotes both. Uh, so there is an obligation to give access to operating systems and to um, all the features uh, and even the hardware controlled by an operating system. Uh, on vertical uh, operability, I think very often the incentives are there for companies to open up. Uh, and uh, that's why I think most ecosystems already have third parties on them. They already uh, interoperate with, uh, with, um, with, uh, with external uh, businesses. I think the question there is one of how. <laughs> how do you interoperate? And, and so if, if we step back, uh, the, the reason uh, we, uh, as Agustin said, the reason we uh, promote or regulators promote interoperability, it's to promote um, innovation and choice. Fundamentally, what interoperability does is to bring more players into, um, into the scene, if you want. Uh, when it's in vertical interoperability, you bring, you bring more complementers. Uh, in horizontal uh, interoperability, you bring more players at the same level. Uh, in vertical interoperability, you're providing access to a service or a facility that is considered necessary for the provision of a service. And uh, in horizontal or interoperability, you're providing access to an established network or, 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 or uh, a market. So normally that is done to uh, uh, extend the benefits of, of network uh, and network effects to, to competitors. Um, so, so the idea is that by bringing, bringing more players, you have more choice, uh, more innovation in the market. Uh, now the devil is in the details and it's like, is that always going to happen and how does that work? And I think that's where uh, every exercise is going to be different and, uh, and it's crucial how you do it. And, and also to pay attention, what are the condition in which you're doing this? Because those are also going to determine whether it, it makes sense and it's going to work. Uh, so in, uh, in, in the context of, uh, of uh, vertical interoperability, I think the, as I said, I think most of the time uh, there's a win-win situation uh, in bringing complementers. And that's why most ecosystems do that. The question there is what is the level of control that you leave to the ecosystem or the platform? Uh, and I think that is a question that is, uh, hasn't been properly dealt with or analyzed. So the DMA takes a very expansive approach where they say, you know, you have to give access to almost everything on, on non-discriminatory conditions. Uh, that, that can, I think, create some problems because ecosystem are very well-managed organization, I think. And every ecosystem is different. So some ecosystem have more roles uh, than others, and that is by design. Uh, some ecosystem have a different market positioning and sell different characteristics than others. And so by establishing uh, almost like standardized rules of access, in a way you're standardizing ecosystems, uh, decreasing the level of their differentiation in the sense that developers now can go in the same way in principle to any ecosystem, which basically um, brings the higher degree of homogeneity to, to, uh, to the platform world. So in a way you're increasing 
participation and potentially innovation and at developer level, but you're decreasing it at platform ecosystem level. And, and, and the balance of that, I'm not sure anybody knows <laughs> what the result is, but the incentives to invest in the ecosystem are lower. Uh, and there's a lot of tools that people don't think about that exist in ecosystem that are put together by ecosystem to facilitate the develop the, the, the growth and development of their of their complementers. And, and people um, are mostly not aware of those, uh, but they're instrumental for the success of the people of the ecosystem. And so I think there's uh, there's going to have to be uh, well it, it's going to, we're see what the provisions provide, uh, but if you had excessive homogenization of ecosystem, you may find yourself in a in a situation where you're actually favoring uh, tipping uh, because if there's no differentiation among platforms, you only need one really, uh, and and so I think that's a, that's a dynamic that will be worth. Uh, watching all this is speculative. Obviously, we don't know yet, uh, but but there is that dynamic. I think that people may not have thought about um, uh, sufficiently, uh, and and it could be that there's a balance. Uh, most likely, I think there's a balance that will be achieved uh, to try and preserve different um, different options, uh, also at eco ecosystem and platform level. Uh, now, at, at, um, at, at the horizontal uh, interoperability, and now we reach the, the messaging one, which I think is, is very, very interesting. I think that one of the key of success is what's the value of this extra access to the network? Uh, and I think they'll, this was, will change uh, or may change by service. In, when we think of email or phone service, the, uh, the value is there because it's a very simple, homogeneous, almost single task service that is really reliant and only reliant on the, the, the communication, right? That, that's what you want to communicate with people. And there's very little else that you do uh, when you communicate with those services. In the messaging world, uh, instinctively you would say it's the same. People are texting each other and, and that's what they want. They want to be able to text, uh, which is uh, how we think of SMS world. So my question here is, is messaging today uh, the same as, as texting? Uh, and, and, and that's where, I, I don't know, I'm not sure. I mean, we know that messaging services have evolved enormously. Uh, they're no longer homogeneous products. They have um, a, a lot of features uh, with which they compete. So you have personalization of experience, you have customizations, you have network management. You have any number of different formats that you can use. You have different ways of connecting. Uh, you, your messages can be uh, uh, enhanced. Uh, they can uh, they can uh, they can be video. They can be ephemeral. They can be they can have special effects. They can pop up, you know, confettis. <laughs> they can. Uh, so it's 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 become a way of expression that is a lot more sophisticated. Than, than just pure messaging. Uh, and it's also increasingly uh, absorbing additional products and features. So messaging apps are going to have payments. Some of them already do that. They're going to have content streaming. They're going to have, uh, it's the, the boundaries of what is messaging, what is content, what is uh, almost a social network are, are uh, becoming very blurred. Uh, and already messaging apps are used as a, mini social network space. Uh, and, and, and so and when I say mini, it's that it's just a lot more managed, right? The groups, but but they're already operate a little bit like that. And so to what extent just basic interoperability as it's as is mandated by the DMA uh, is going to have a dent on that. And to what extent people are looking at messaging in that way. Uh, and this is a really open question. I don't know. Uh, so, but my point here is that the, the way users see the service is going to be determinant to whether this interoperability will succeed or not. Uh, it is, is, what is the part of basic communication in that service? Uh, and it's, it, it's unclear. So, um, so here, I think we have to maybe manage expectation. Consumers already must multi-home uh, extensively in messaging systems. Uh, most people have more than one messaging app on their phones, sometimes two, sometimes three. Uh, they use them. Uh, 
Uh, and many users also, uh, there is empirical evidence that many users actually like to separate their different networks in different messaging apps. They like to manage their, uh, their, their social graph in a way, in that way. Uh, and so that also raises the question that are those are those services really fungible to the to the extent that the DMA presumes that they are? Augustine, what do you think about this uh, about these uh, shields or defenses against the, the reform? Yes, thank you, uh, thank you, Helena, also for outlining all the the different arguments. There are uh, many arguments that were discussed also during during the, the negotiations, and I think that is. It's also important to go through to them to also understand why uh, at the end of the day we are regulating um, interoperability in the in the digital markets act and interoperability for instant messaging services so when it comes to horizontal interoperability they could have been also other core platform services that could have been um, object of, of this type of remedy but it was chosen to be on the basis of interoperability of um, uh, instant communication um, uh, services um, for the reason that basically there was a need there is also an expectation from from users to be able to communicate with uh, with the uh, with each other bypassing also barriers that naturally exist you mentioned again a, a multi-homing uh, of course there are many services out there but the question is whether these services actually can penetrate the market which is I will not use the word dominated in the competition law sense, but in a much more looser way, <laughs> you know what I, what I mean, um, by one um, incumbent provider. Uh, and of course, because of the very strong presence of network effects that justifies having this type of intervention to be able to open up uh, this market. We can also not forget about the design of the provision. This is asymmetrical legislation. So. It's only those gatekeepers, are those companies are going to be designated as gatekeepers that will have to offer the possibility to interoperate. But at the same time, it's voluntary. It's voluntary, of course, for the for the user, if um, he or she wants to um, be able to interact with um, um, uh, with users in other in other uh, ecosystems. But also for the providers of the communication services themselves. So if they want to offer interoperate. Uh, to offer the possibility for the users to interoperate and communicate with others that are in other um, services, well, that is something that they are able to request, and that's a right that the DMA gives them. Um, but of course, the fact that are both asym is, is both asymmetric legislation and voluntarily um, also means that we also need to see how the market is going to develop on this and whether there will be actually companies requesting to offer these features to, um, uh, to consumers. Uh, another is an element that we also need to bear in mind, what concerns the question, of course, of, of investments or any potential trade offs that this is a very targeted intervention to basic um, features. So that means that there can be innovation around this basic feature. There is no obstacle for, um, uh, for that. Even then, we also can think whether the final, final text of the DMA uh, actually nails you know, the problems, because if we think that there are se several steps for implementation. So, for example, uh, group chats will be possible only two years after the signation. Uh, sorry, no. Um, yes, two years after the signation. Calls will be four years after the signation. So, we are really talking about something that will be fully in place down, you know, six years time, which is quite a lot of time in in this type of uh, uh, of, uh, of market. But of course, that's a question of how the DMA has to be signed as a result of a, um, a compromise uh, between the, 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 decision, the decision makers. Um, in, any, uh, in any event, and I think goes back to your question, uh, Eliana, is uh, this type of um, uh, services, you know, like messaging, the traditional messages, the SMSs that we have. Well, I think it's, we're thinking more of an, perhaps on, a, on, an, on an evolution, which of course new features have been uh, introduce and a very valid question I think is whether those basic features that are identified today are going to be the same basic features in uh, six years time or ten years time it also brings into a discussion the question of how to keep the DMA uh, up to date and valid in relation to the legislative objective for which it was designed which is contestability and uh, fairness for uh, 
the services that it um, that, that it covers. And then just a very final reflection on this question of um, uh, multi-homing versus you know interoperability. And I think that the both can coexist. So just to give a very practical example, for work, you know, many people use Teams. When you are using Teams, you know, and you just want them to disconnect, then you go to your personal application to communicate with your peers. So you could have, for example, or benefit from interoperability to communicate with your peers that are in different networks and still have your Teams uh, application on your phone in order to use it for commercial for professional uh, purposes. So of course, both things you know can uh, complement and 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 one does not necessarily precede over over or the other. Uh, Simonetta, you mentioned that you have uh, produced a report or, or addressing probably some of these uh, um, counter arguments as well. So, what would be your comments on 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 the on the list uh, of 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 counter arguments provided by by Eliana? Uh, thank you. Uh, we have been discussing these questions for very long time, so I was very happy during the technical workshops. Then we will say, okay, now we have Article 7, let's try to implement it. Because the legislator is never perfect. Uh, Augustine has mentioned things that the legislator could have done better. Okay? So, for instance, why not group uh, messaging from the very beginning? So, and then uh, the why not social networking, uh, um, social networking interoperability from the very beginning? So, the, then on the other side, uh, yes, there was the choice of the gradual approach, as Diana was saying, Agustina has also made very clear. So just the, the first functionalities, which are basic. Okay, how did they decide that they were the basic functionalities? Did they, did they decide in the best of the possible ways? We don't know. I mean, the legislator has made choices, okay? And then we should implement them. And then there is also the possibility of upgrading the list of functionalities going forward. And that could possibly address one of the quite, but quite uh, on per, quite uh, precise um, criticism that Eliana had. Things might change, so it's there is it's not just in stone forever. And things are going to change, and this is the beauty of regulating companies. This is the piece of regulation. Those gatekeepers are going to be regulated companies. So it means that there will be a dialogue between the regulator with all the possible help we could get from, from the community and the, for instance, also from the uh, uh, consumer associations uh, and other regulators, the higher levels. So it's there, it's there to be implemented. It's not going to be, it's not perfect, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's the solution that our EU legislator has chosen for the moment. And the other thing about basic functionalities, I think that the, the ones, the, the, one, the, the regulator, the competition authority who said it first, and still I think it he, he was perfect, perfectly on point, was the UK um, competition authority, which from the very beginning said, let's start from standardized functionalities. And this is, we, I mean, we mentioned email. Email, it has been uh, commodified. I mean, we, we use emails, which are standards, okay? We use different email accounts, perhaps dividing private life from work, and we are perfectly fine with that. Of course, now we have so many things going on on uh, um, additional functionality to messaging services, but some of the basic functionalities are there. We, are, we all agree they are okay. And uh, why shouldn't we start from them? And then if necessary, we will move from there and go into perhaps a deeper, um, interoperability, broader interoperability if necessary. So the, the, the thing that we need to rerun the old discussion, I think that book has saved. Thank you very much, Simonetta. Before reverting to the mechanics, before uh, uh, discussing the, the core of the problem, so to say, how, uh, how the, the DMA envisages the, the, the implementation and design of, of, of the mechanism of, of, uh, of interoperability, I wanted to ask Ileana if, if you want to to provide some feedback to, to, to the counter arguments, to your counter arguments. Yeah, so I, I, I wouldn't characterize what I um, said as, 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 as criticism necessarily. I think they're more caveats. Uh, it's, it's more, uh, what I'm trying here is a little bit is to manage expectations. I think 
uh, there, there might be a lot of assumptions being made about how messaging services are used or what people expect from them. Uh, and, and I think the reason that's relevant is because it's going to the, be determinant for how we measure success. Uh, and, and as I say, I think the way people are handling or using their messaging system is slowly deviating for that of a very homogeneous service. Uh, which will, I think, uh, generate a, a lower desire potentially for interoperability. And what does that do when we evaluate the success of this measure? Do we see that as a fault or, or do we just, how do we interpret that? So that, that's why I think uh, we may want to manage expectations here. The, um, I just want to note, yes, we have done a commoditized email, but we, there's no innovation in email. Uh, I mean, if you look what's happening on messaging and what's happening on email, it's a world apart. Uh, and, and that's a little bit what we're talking about here. So if we, the more you're standardized a product, the more you freeze it in time, uh, because moving standards is very, very difficult. Uh, if the reason I think uh, the decision was to interoperate at basic levels is because those are the levels that, you know, it's our, our homogeneous usage, voice, text, uh, that represent uh, an increasingly small percentage of what people can do or how people interact over messaging. Uh, but raising uh, the, bringing interoperability as those more, as the, at that feature level, I think raises the complexity uh, of, of the exercise quite a bit. Uh, and I'm not sure people were, uh, felt they were able to cope with that. Uh, I mean, if, also the incentives to bring in those features once they're um, they become standard or homogeneous, um, it's unclear which ones would survive and which ones would not be worth inventing. Um, so, so I think we can see that, that there is a trade-off between standardizing or interoperating and uh, and 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 reducing the the evolution <laughs> speed of that product there. And, and, and I think that's one of the reasons people were somewhat a bit careful about, about I mean, careful to the extent that they, they, uh, they started only with those basic features. Thank you, Ilana. Uh, Augustine, um, maybe uh, when we discuss um, the, the mechanics, uh, Article 7 and, and, and other provisions of the DMA associated with, with is implementing the, the obligation itself. Um, uh, if you want to comment on, on uh, the email and the difference between email and, and messengers, of course, you're welcome to, to, to implement it into your, into your answer and Simonetta as well. But maybe if I can ask you about some success stories, do we, do we know in other industries that we can say that, okay, that's obviously every industry is unique and every circumstance is unique, et cetera, but maybe there are some models which can be somehow incorporated or learned or, elucidate uh, some, some useful practices. If, if, if I might, um, we, we do have examples. You know, we have been using interoperability remedies you know, across, across sector. A very recent example, and one that I'm familiar because of the nature of my work is open banking. And open banking is basically you know, a form of interoperability, access to APIs, you know, which enable the entrance of third-party payment providers in a market that was considered not to be competitive enough, the payment markets dominated by, by the banks. And I remember the discussion started in the, in the UK, actually. Um, and, the, and the question was, what to do? You know, how can we open up these markets? And that is where the concept of open banking um, emerge and then in Europe that was uh, imported in the in the context of the payment services uh, directive. And there is for this a very good example because we are talking about accessing APIs uh, which enable to access you know extremely sensitive uh, data, you know financial data, your payment data, so on and so forth. And um, so of course it's not something that was done from one day to the other, but the approach was considered to be the right one to the point that now the European Commission wants to extend that across the financial services industry in what they call open finance. So it is not something that is uh, unexplored. We have you know, experiences uh, across, uh, uh, across, across sectors. Um, but for me, what is also important, which uh, actually relates to one of the comments of, of Elian, is how do we measure success? 
how can we establish that this intervention has been successful? Of course, one is to look at the objectives of the um, legal text. In this case, you know, ensure there is more contestability in these markets and uh, are uh, products more uh, fairly sell to, um, uh, to consumer. But I think it is also important to bear in mind is the steps of how we go there. In a first um, level, we have the implementation by the own you know, gay, uh, gatekeepers in the case of, uh, in the case of Article 6, Article uh, no 7, this part of the specifications that are, uh, that are needed, which of course um, would affect the, the effectiveness of the, of the rules uh, uh, as such. Because for example, there is a discussion around the standardization of the APIs. Should each individual company develops its own API, should we think of a standard universal uh, API and what does it mean going from one solution or the other? What does it mean from the point of view of the gatekeeper? What does it mean from the point of view of the um, third party you know, provider, uh, the ones who access, the fact that it should be easier than to develop one single solution that can interoperate with uh, all the uh, potentially designated uh, gate, uh, gatekeepers. So I think that the on the implementation is we're going to make actually a huge difference in terms of the success of the of the measure such. And then another element that we also need to bring into the discussion relates to anti-circumvention. Um, and there is a, a very um, a strong provision in, in the DMA, which implies that you know effective compliance needs to be assessed in light with um, of course, it's, a, it's, a, it's implementation, making sure that this case, the gatekeeper cannot bypass its obligations through you know, technical, contractual, or any type of, of mechanism. For example, in the context of consumer-facing matter, ma uh, markets, the deployment of, of dark patterns, you know, uh, nudging or pushing consumers to take certain decisions, so on and so forth. So I think when we design the, the, the compliance, both at the level of the gatekeeper, but also at some point, also the, with the intervention of the European Commission, in the case of uh, certainly in the case of the of the interoperability uh, obligation, how we're going to make sure that this compliance is also made in light of the anti-circumvention provisions of the DMA, of the DMA as such. Thank you, Augustin. Uh, Simonetta, what uh, coming back to the, to, to to the event uh, by the Commission? Um, do you? I noticed there were different, uh, you know. Uh, into attempts to interpret the, the scope of, of the obligation and how often uh, this kind of uh, consent should be requested from, from end users. Is it per service, per message? What are you, you how, how, it must, how should we design it to make it functional and not to annoy maybe users with, uh, with uh, too often repetitive questions? Or maybe we have to, it's our duty because different messenger is different, et cetera. What are your view on this, on this how to strike this delicate balance? <clears throat> Thank you, Oleg. This is definitely one of the core questions. So user experience, and I, there were quite a lot of engineers uh, in the room uh, thinking about it. Because I mean, in the end, as Agustin has already said, it's about uh, consumers feeling safe, trusting services, uh, making choices they were perhaps not considering before that, seeing openness when there was no openness, seeing the, seeing the possibility that could choose perhaps even more uh, privacy-friendly uh, messaging services uh, or perhaps the messaging service. So it's, it's about structuring uh, that. And that's the very, very important point that I, I have no answer for that, okay? But this is going to be one of the things that really, I mean, engineers, consumer organizations, behavioral psychologists uh, and many others uh, should really uh, should really think about and come up with very good solutions. We had during the technical workshop also some examples of possible user uh, and your experience uh, interface and things like that, but it's going to be key. This is going to be definitely key, but I think as Agustin mentioned, I mean, it's not uh, just here. It's when we think of open finance. I mean, <laughs> there are so many issues with that. With that uh, from that perspective also there, I mean, it's really, it's a broader uh, broader question. But perhaps I would like to go back just to something we have discussed earlier. So how do we measure success? Well, definitely, uh, it's going to be about choice, okay? Choice that we don't have it, we don't have now because of the siloed ecosystems. And there is there was something in the room uh, when we discussed it, uh, 
last Monday, two Mondays ago, uh, that really to me was just a sign of success. And it was the Internet Engineering Task Force, which has already started a new working group called MIMI on more instant messaging interoperability. And they were starting this working group, so possibly um, ending with the standardization for many things which matter to uh, messaging services because of the DMA. I mean, it was a new framework created for new initiatives from the technological perspective, perspective to pop up start discussing it. They were not doing it because they, they, they were thinking, well, what's the point? I mean, <laughs> so nowadays we have new initiatives and this is really something very important and it's a measure of success from my perspective. Thank you, Simonetta. Eliana, if I may ask you, uh, coming to this question of how to, to implement, well, there is not much, there is obviously scope to, scope to interpret the, the parameters of, of, the, of the obligation, but they are binding, obliga binding obligations and uh, it, it's it's more about inter interpreting and implementing. So we we hear different visions about um, maybe it's 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 important to design uh, independent standards standards or the gatekeepers themselves have to uh, design the API uh, in, in in the way how they understand it must be most efficient and uh, secure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, what are the position? Um, what is your position? You represent your views, but maybe you also know the the views of of the industry. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't claim to know uh, the view of the industries. I'm not sure um, they're even fully formed <laughs> as as we go. Uh, but I think on on the issue of standardization, um, I mean, we, it, it's what we said before. The more you standardize, uh, I mean you. you the more you simplify and, and quote unquote freeze. Now standardization has the uh, benefit of providing certainty and clarity and, and it's very difficult to game a standard, right? So the, the standard is there, you have to comply. It's been, if it's done properly, it's, it's, it's fully specified. Um, and so there's some, there's an attraction to that. It's also less costly for, uh, a smaller company who wants to interoperate with several players to just build for one standard. So, so there are benefits to that. Now, the trade-off is the same one we discussed before. Once you standardize, you freeze. And so the company um, will provide you a cheaper way to access it. On the other hand, you may not be, you may be able to access less uh, and you will never be able to change what you access because the, the standard is there. So the company may evolve its service, but the standard will not evolve. Uh, and, and so you freeze a, a, a tiny part, or well, not tiny at this point, I mean, let's be honest, but but you freeze a, a part of the usage of the service um, and, and, and then that is very difficult then to change. So, so I think there are trade-offs. Uh, so if really it is basic, basic interoperability, it, it, could, it could be an option. Uh, but the, the, the interoperability may be richer uh, and, and, and more uh, and, 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 and give more options if it's not standardized, uh, not fully standardized. Now also there's the issue of, um, we're talking about here uh, about more complex services. Uh, there's the issue of how companies feel, the, the responsibility that they feel towards what's, happen, what's happening uh, with their users or the interactions that those users um, um, experience when they use their product. And, and, and so I, I suspect companies will want to keep a certain level of control in terms of uh, what happens on issues like integrity or privacy. Uh, and that relates to the consent flows and the notifications. And I think that's going to be a, a complicated debate uh, because, and, and I think there's a tension even within the commission. You see the DMA has provisions that both foster data sharing and some provisions that actually uh, want to limit uh, data combination. And, and so how they will, um, consider notifications and caveats in both cases is going to be interesting. And I'm not sure we there is yet a very uh, unified or uniform approach to how we deal with privacy uh, on, on, on digital services and what are the and what are the things people should be alerted to and how. I don't think there is now a common view uh, 
on this on, on, in all circumstances, right? So here the temptation will be for regulators to want to nudge in different places for different things and companies to want to nudge in different places for different things and, um, and not having a, a privacy standard of information, I think is going to be um, a bit complicated. The uh, on, on that on that said, I think it's 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 fairly understandable that some companies, if they're re if they're liable for the commitment that they make to their users, uh, they will want to be very explicit about that commitment, and they they want to put the boundaries and alert the users when those commitments cannot be fulfilled. Uh, and and I think that's legitimate because companies, and I know. <laughs> <laughs> from experience, companies are held liable, even reputation-wise, for what happens on their platforms. And so they will want to, and they have been made to stand by the commitments that they make. Uh, and so being fuzzy around that, at least with so some companies, is going to be very difficult. They will not want to be fuzzy about this. Uh, also, because there's the, the suffered the, the costs of <laughs> of love fuzziness, so they will they will, may want to be very explicit about what they can guarantee and what they cannot what they cannot guarantee. And I think it would be unfair at this point, having asked them to be fully liable, to now ask them not to be fully liable, right? Okay, okay, thank you, Diana. Augustine, you you were among the 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 the, the earliest protagonists of anti circumvention provision and from what i can uh, we can hear from, from uh, in the discussion that you know that uh, on one hand we can interpret as an attempt to circumvent pretty much any any action or, or on the gatekeeper side on the other hand uh, it it it's it's really difficult to somehow to 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 not to see some some elements of kind of uh, not opportunistic, but maybe you know tailored response or disproportionate response or emphasis on some um, issues of integrity or privacy or security or investment or any other of this long catalog of things. How do you see in practice? How should we? How would it be somehow? Would the Commission find this delicate path between Sila and Haribda? Would it be learning by doing? Uh, try to have a look at in a few years' time. So. Thank you, uh, Olis. I think the starting point is that this is not competition law. So here, the European legislator has already made a trade-off. No, we might like it more or less, but there is already a trade-off. So the effective compliance needs to be assessed in light of each individual obligations, the objectives of the regulation itself, contestability, fair markets, but also using the instruments that the anti-circumvention provision gives you. So basically, there's a toolbox for the European Commission to assess whether an obligations have been complied or, or not. Something that we were very clear from the very beginning, we need to avoid too much discretion of interpretation, not only from the point of view of the regulator, but also from the own gatekeepers. We also need to be mindful of the fact that the companies that are going to be designated a gatekeeper, do, they don't have the best records in terms of compliance. Uh, and there are many cases across across Europe, competition law, consumer law, uh, data protection law, so on and so forth. So that's why it was so, so important to be as clear as possible in each individual obligation. Of course, there is no possible to capture everything. That's why there is the possibility for further specifications uh, with the European Commission in a sort of, we can call it a regulatory dialogue with the, uh, with the Commission, with possibility of input from from third parties to make sure that the rules that are included are effectively effectively um, uh, implemented. And of course, as Simonetta said, we are going to be able to assess whether we have achieved that object or not when we see the results in the market, when we see whether consumers have benefited from, 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 from more choice, uh, when we see that you know, the different obligations kind of are boiled down to complete changes in the in the services of the um, of the of the of the gatekeepers, um, we have been very vocal, as you as you rightly said, uh, to make sure that the European Commission has the tools available. So, for example, the question for dark patterns. We know, as a matter of fact, that with very very small changes in the user interface, you can reach a completely different outcome, or we can lead consumers to take different sort of sort of decisions. That's why it was so important to make sure that we can also assess whether a gatekeeper has complied with different obligations by looking at 
um, how the interface has been has been uh, designed. Uh, a good example of this relates, for example, to the more consumer-facing obligations. You know, the prohibition when it comes to the tracking uh, of consumers in third-party uh, websites. You know, which requires a specific choice by the consumer and uh, and consent according to to the GDPR. Here we're going to also to be able to assess, you know, whether the design of the of the choice architectures actually would enable the exercise of that specific uh, right for the consumer in this case to give uh, a specific choice and and to consent to the to the data uh, collection and, uh, and, and processing. So I think that more and more the regulators also need to be mindful uh, of that and use those possibilities that are in the regulatory framework. Why it was important for us to have that written in the law? Because of course, if you don't have that, that, that possibility, you have a, a, a broad toolkit in order to assess compliance, that is something that the gatekeepers can oppose and say, Ooh, what you are asking me, uh, actually, you are not entitled to. You know? So from that point of view, we think that was so important. And also, that's kind of part of the part of the um, uh, of the system to have the, the right rules in place. But now the question is where the commission is going to have the right people in place in 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 inside the, the commission to be able to you know um, apply uh, apply the the, the the provision and assess the the conformity and the and the compliance in light of this um, uh, of these uh, yeah, possibilities that exist under the DMA. And maybe as a follow as, as, as a follow up question, um, you mentioned the right people, and we have this long discussions about the, the different philosophy of regulatory philosophy or different regulatory approach to to the DMA, in, not only in comparison to competition law, but any kind of compliance mechanism which requires box ticking endeavor to a large degree, whereas where we know what the the right thing to do and what is uh, kind of the, where the infringement or non-compliance instances. Here it looks that the boundary are a little bit more kind of. Uh, less clearly designed for obvious reasons because we don't know so much about this rapidly evolving field, etc. Do you think that we are on the right track with with uh, changing or reforming this uh, regulatory approach to to, to 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 that regulators are well equipped to to proceed with what they have so skillfully designed in, in the first place? Um, again, bearing in mind that we are not talking about competition law, and we have, for example. Uh, cases at national level where regulators are already thinking of the time of expertise that is needed. The ACM in the Netherlands, they are one of the front runners when it comes to incorporating behavioral insights in their work, not only in the context of competition, but also you know, consumer protection or even the regulatory powers that they have uh, in, the, in, in the Netherlands in, in, in our regulated industries. Um, and I think that when it comes to the European Commission concretely, and the implementation of the, DM, the DMA, which will go hand by hand with the, with the DSA. But certainly you need to think about what is the expertise I need in place in order to be able to check whether these provisions are being complied with. And certainly with economists and lawyers, you're not going to go very far. You need to have, like, uh, like we, we discussed previously, you know, computer scientists, behavioral scientists uh, as well, and other type of uh, of disciplines, uh, psychology, so on and so forth, to be able to to effectively um, uh, check whether this um, this is being complied in practice. And we cannot forget also that this type of expertise, it's already in the hands of the of the gatekeepers. The gatekeepers they do have teams of behavioral scientists. So if they do have teams of behavioral scientists to design uh, the user interfaces, why the European Commission will not have their own team to check whether the user interface actually complies with the with the rules of the of the DMA or any other type of, of legislation. So I think that is a is a matter also of evolving in the um, I would say the culture of the um, supervisory authorities or um, the, yeah, the enforcement the enforcement authorities in light of the new challenges and the new expertise that they actually those are being regulated and supervised are starting to acquire or have already acquired. Can I, so can I, yeah, 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 go on. Then. Yeah, can we, let me react to this because I think we're, uh, I mean, it, it, I understand that regulators need to have uh, uh, competent people, but uh, I, I'm, I'm, I, I get a little bit worried when we're thinking the regulator needs to replicate uh, the, the business model of the businesses themselves. 
uh, and, and, and have all behavioral sciences, I think we have to go back, step back a little bit and say, what is the goal of this regulation? Which I'm, I'm, I'm still trying, I'm asking my, myself the questions, like what is the problem that we're trying to solve here? Uh, and it's, it's, it seems to me it's a purely structural one that we would like to have more players have be more important uh, because I don't think we have uh, a problem of access. I don't think we have a problem of accessibility. We don't have a problem of innovation. We don't have, I mean, I don't think anybody can argue that those uh, services have not been innovating. So, so it's really a, a structural problem that we would like to have more people be bigger <laughs> in this market or take bigger relevance. Uh, the, the, so I get a little bit worried or say we need behavioral scientists to achieve that. Uh, uh, I would say, well, well I, wait, <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, uh, I, I think we need to enable or maybe facilitate growth and entry, uh, but we don't know what the market supports. Uh, we don't, and that's why my point at the beginning, uh, users ultimately will decide how they want to use the services and what for, and whether they want to multi-home or not multi-home or interoperate or not. Uh, and so I will be a little bit cautious in, in trying to over-engineer uh, a market here. Uh, I think we need to, I think it's, it, and I respect, you know, the decision to enable entry and growth, uh, but I think we, we don't know uh, what the market will support. And I'm not sure we we trying to, uh, I mean, we, if we're at the stage that we need behavioral, I mean, we need to program people to <laughs> use more services. I, I think that's where I think we need to step back a little bit and, 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 and just wait, you know, let's just wait and see what happens and how people react. Thank Can you, I Mara. make something very quickly on that, Wallace, is how I'm allowed. Um, so for me, what, what passed me a, a little bit of, of that, Diana, is that, um, the same industry, I'm not saying, you know, that Facebook have done it or not, but I have heard, you know, there's a very big company saying that the regulator doesn't understand the technology. The regulator doesn't understand we design our products. But here, what we are trying to achieve is actually that the regulator is able to understand how, how the companies actually work, how the company made choices in order to also identify what are the appropriate remedies for the problems that have been identified. I don't agree, you know, that we don't know what are the problems or we don't know what it's going to achieve. You know, if you talk about, about the innovation, this is not only about just having more players uh, in, the, um, in the market. It's also about having plurality in the innovation that we want to see flourishing in, uh, in Europe and a different type of, of innovation. So far, you know, the innovation has been called it, captured by the, the gatekeepers that have innovated a lot. I'm not arguing against that. But we don't see the relative innovation that we could see if this market were more open. Uh, and I think that is a little bit also the, the, the one of the objectives of the collateral objectives of the of the of the DMA um, uh, as such. Um, but I think when it comes to the design of the of the authorities, what we are seeing is that you know we have been focusing a lot on you know economics and law, which is has been has been uh, important. There is no doubt uh, whatsoever. But when we see that business practices practices become even more and more and more complex, you can just not simply stick to Econ 101. And that is where I think that there is merit to look at how um, the decisions that a company made in relation to the choice architecture, for example, impact you know, the choices that consumers make, choices that will impact at the same time you know, the dynamics, the competition dynamics in a, in a, in a given market. Um, so I think that for me it should be seen as a even as a as a win win because I also help better to understand what are the, the expectations of the um, of the companies that are under supervision as well. Just jumping one second. I just wanted to ask you, Simonetta, you were <laughs> uh, obediently uh, keeping silent for, for for very long time. What do you think about the, all this ca catalog of, of of issues which have been which have been discussed over the last four minutes? That we are slowly but surely uh, finding solutions to them. And this is something which makes me <laughs> very confident in many things going on. Uh, but the thing is, I would, I would like just to say perhaps two things which have been touched upon. First of all, interoperability in the DMA, as Liliana said quite correctly at the beginning, we are vertical, horizontal. You should not forget that we have many interoperability, interoperability in the initiatives going on, I would say, many other areas. Let's not forget data. Okay, cloud services, data interoperability, 
So I think that automatically the Commission is building up those capabilities okay, to really to think, okay, what do we need to achieve interoperability? Do we need new standards? Should we promote them? Should we mandate them? Is there, are there other ways of achieving them? Is the market able to provide them? So these are all things that which, which are being experimented, not only in the area of the DNA, but they will see it much more broadly. And I think it's up, it's a really necessary to do that. Let's not forget the internet is based on standards. I mean, it's the, the way, why, the reason why we have the internet is because of protocols. Of course, then protocols can be hijacked, they can be made proprietary, and we have seen it many times already. But okay, we go back perhaps to the to the main spirit of the internet. Now we were thinking of the digital society and the economy we are looking forward to. So that would be something that I, I wanted to say, but I think uh, our time is a little bit over, so I, I won't indulge anymore <laughs> in other thoughts. Can I react quickly? The, I, mean, I think that raises a really interesting question because the, the and I think that's a, a, a conundrum that is underlying the entire DMA is like, what do we think of ecosystems? So the internet is not really an ecosystem, right? When we talk about those, those very commoditized platforms uh, are extremely useful. A lot of things happens on them, uh, but they're not organized ecosystems. And and so and and I think that the DMA is 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 really a uh, the entire DMA is a little bit of a reaction to you know we're not sure what we think about ecosystem or we're not sure that's what we would like to uh, to favor and so we're going to open them up and try to turn them into just this basic support infrastructure the the and and I think it's uh, I'm not sure that's the right path uh, and and it's a really when I say it's not a I'm, I'm really not sure, <laughs> so, but I think that is something that we need to think about a little bit harder. Is like, do we? Is there something we gain with ecosystem management? Is there something we gain with ecosystem integration? And 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 there's a little bit more closed, but potentially a lot more functional uh, environments of, of of integrated solutions. And and I agree that if we only had one, it would be a problem. But you know, it looks like we are uh, seeing the emergence of, of a few of them. Uh, and and I think uh, European regulators don't seem to be comfortable with that. And and so, but but I think that is ultimately a discussion that would be worth having and solving. It's like, are we? Uh, what do we think about highly functional, well integrated ecosystems that are not fully open? Um, but I, I just leave that that question because yes, the internet is very useful, but but I think every governance serves different purposes, and and so do we need only one, or do we need to impose one? We are approaching the the, the end of the hour, and we obviously have a cooling off question, uh, recommendations for students, which uh, which is quite popular among our students, uh, as far as I'm aware of. But I, I wanted also to look a, a little bit, if 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 I may ask you about the the mechanics of Article Seven, and um, in conjunction maybe or not with anti circumvention provisions. Obviously, from from juristic point of view, you can when you read the, uh, the, the the text itself, it on one hand it's like the part of the sentence appears to be very you know well well coined and tailored to somehow to envisage all possible shortcomings and all possible ways to reinterpret in in, in a kind of. Uh, in a def more defensive fashion, but then obviously you can definitely you can or my interpretation can see the the the, the choice of words, which uh, which somehow softens the, the the whole structure of 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 articles. For example, in article one we have gate requirement that gatekeeper should provide the necessary technical interfaces or similar solutions that facilitate. Merrily facilitate. In Article 7.3, we have the gatekeeper shall comply with the reasonable. And again, what is reasonable? Reasonable is such, such a wide term, a request for interoperability. Augustine, I know you, you, you deal with these issues for a very long time, and you somehow understand that it's impossible probably to design perfectly a rule. So it all be subject to interpretation and uh, how we will be how it will be enforced in practice. But 
looking at the, at the text itself, do you think it leaves the opportunity to implement the provisions of, of DMA effectively? Or it's also full of caveats which would somehow uh, slow, slow down its, uh, its, its, its performance? I want to believe that we will be able to implement it, you know, effectively. We are just adopted. <laughs> so certainly um, uh, a lot a lot still needs to happen until we see this a reality. And um, we, we cannot forget that I mentioned below, this is um, this provision is voluntary. So the gatekeepers are going to they're going to be designated and will have to offer it, but then it's for the third party providers to see whether they want to benefit or not and offer that to the final to the final user. So of course a lot will depend on the access requests that the that the third parties will uh, uh, will make. And there we will certainly discuss issues of interpretation. We cannot be naive always, no matter how clear the legislation is, there will always be questions of uh, interpretation. What we hope is at the end of the day that interpretation is done in line with the objectives of the of the of the DMA. Also, we cannot forget, and Simonetta mentioned it at the beginning, this is a very, very prescriptive obligation compared to other obligations, which may raise also similar um, inter interpretation um, uh, questions. Um, so I think at the end of the day, um, it, will really, it will really depend on, on, on the implementation and the, the leverage that the Commission has. We cannot forget that under Article 3 and 7, the Commission has some leverage in terms of how this is going to be or should be implemented in practice. And what we hope is that the Commission will look at that also in light of the objectives of the DMA, the anti convention provisions, so we can reach an, uh, an implementation, which of course will lead to effective, uh, effective uh, compliance, but mostly important that we don't have to revisit, you know, two, three years later, because we realize that it's not uh, compliant or that it's not delivering the results that we, that we expected. So we hope to be able to challenge challenge all these issues from the very beginning that the commission works together with the designated gatekeepers and the parties are ask, actually asking access and, and, and inter interoperability from, uh, from them. Um, so if this is all done from the very beginning and we're trying to avoid you know, problems in the future and we don't apply the logic of competition law, which is you comply and then we see whether it is fine or not, because then we go back to the same discussion of timing. Know, but then we're going to be discussing compliance you know, for, for 10 years, especially bearing in mind that um, the implementation of this specific uh, provision is done in slices. And we already have a, a temporary framework within the obligation itself. Uh, and ultimately, what people want is at the end of the day that you can enjoy these basic features you know, as fast as possible and, and without having to wait or, or caring or whether in two years you need to offer group chats or in, in four years you need to allow uh, allow calls just one thing quickly perhaps if i can add to uh, what agustin has said we should not forget that this text is being already read quite carefully by technologies okay i get emails from technologies asking me yeah but what about this text so i think when they say facilitate interoperability they perhaps also refer to technical language okay they find already somewhere else so this is the beauty also of the Digital market type, which is, uh, I think, really going towards the more technological approach. Of course, of course, we are lawyers, we are economists, but there are technologies. They are extremely important in this type of regulation. You know, it's just uh, when it comes to adjectives, uh, I always try to imagine the endpoint uh, where how the judges will interpret them, and that's obviously a big question. Probably not not for for for, uh, for 2023. But uh, it, we have to, I am probably mindful or excessively mindful of, 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 of this. Simonetta, what do you think ultimately about the, the, this mechanism? Do you think that we will manage to make gatekeepers uh, compliant with the rules? On one hand, on the other hand, do you see the real demand uh, on, on the business user side uh, to, to, in, in opening up uh, access to, to, to this infrastructure? Thank you, Alex. So it's a difficult question for the end. <laughs> well, first part, yes. <laughs> Gatekeepers will comply with that. There are so many different mechanisms in the DMA, um, thanks to which you will be able to uh, uh, succeed this result. 
Mm, what about the market demand? Well, I think there is already market demand, interestingly, from the side of other gatekeepers wanting perhaps to uh, reach some more level of interoperability with other gatekeep uh, potential gatekeepers. So this is an interesting uh, development already. What perhaps I, I don't know yet, whether uh, small uh, providers of messaging services will be able to overcome all the hurdles, which are definitely there, because we want the service to, uh, to be secure, um, private, uh, privacy respecting, if not enhancing. So there are quite a lot of technical questions there. And I think that we have a very nice uh, technical discussion ahead. And now, we, uh, so you can, you can kind of provide your one minute recommendation for students. Agustin, what would be your recommendation? So my recommendation for um, a students or anybody um, getting soon in the, uh, in the field of uh, law and economics, uh, in particular, when it comes to digital markets, it always remains curious, challenge yourself. Uh, the technology changes, evolves, and so must our, our thinking. And, and, and therefore, um, yeah, just always uh, keep, an, keep an open mind, uh, listen to, uh, to everybody, but always form your, your own opinion. First of all, I would say just be modest. I mean, I think it's very important and don't, don't worry about uh, not having <clears throat> very high expectations from uh, early on. Work hard. No, it's uh, as uh, as we have heard uh, during our discussion. It's a very challenging field. So there are many things going on from economic, legal, or technological perspective. Uh, find meaning in what you do beyond money, because money, of course, is great, but perhaps it's not uh, enough in the long run. And enjoy the ride. Um, yeah, my advice. Uh... From my experience, uh, it, it's worth investing to understand the market. It's good to learn the law. It's good to understand the theory, economics. But the key is to understand the markets. So spend time understanding the businesses, understanding how they're making money, how they're creating value, who they're competing with in reality, and have your what you learn in school help you sort and understand that information, but the key information is what's happening out there. And so I think they need to invest in that as well. Augustine Reina, Ileana Garces, Simonetta Bezzolo, thank you very much for finding time and sharing with, with all of us your, your original and, and thought-provoking ideas.